time we're at the life of Moses. So by faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child and they were not afraid of the king's commandments. Well, all this we studied last week, so I didn't get to get to the, the peroration or the ending of the, the teaching. We ran out of time. As we did with the life of Joseph, we could certainly do with the life of Moses. It was prophesied even by Moses that a greater prophet was to come, like him, greater than he. And that prophet would be the son of God. So it's a typical picture. So typology is so vital, so vitally important. And so we take some liberties with the text. The text actually just gives us a few verses here. Uh, but we want to go beyond that and, and try to look behind the scene and see what we can from the life of Moses and his identity with the Lord Jesus Christ. So we'll speak of Moses as a uh, type of Christ and what a type he is, in fact, in so many areas. Uh, so, so let's just go down quickly through the list here. So we have uh, Moses at his birth, an evil king, Pharaoh, tried to kill him as a baby. Find this in Exodus 122, and Pharaoh charged all his people, saying, Every son that is born ye shall cast into the river, and every daughter ye shall save alive. Well, of course, we just got through with studying this, and will on Sunday, as a matter of fact, even more from Matthew chapter 2, when King Herod tried to kill the baby Jesus. And we see then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding wrath and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem two years of age and under. Uh, so it was terrible slaughter. And again, we'll have much to say on Sunday about this very passage. But notice in both cases, we have an evil king that wants to kill the deliverer, Moses. And um, Moses escapes his wrath, miraculously. And so does the baby Jesus, right? Remember the angel comes and warns Joseph, get out of town. Uh, they were there long enough, at least for the circumcision of the child, eight days after his birth. And I think that would be enough right there. And then on they went with the treasures. Uh, they went down to, um, to Egypt and they could afford staying there for a length of time because, well, not only do we have to hear that uh, uh, Herod dies and that happens in 4 BC and, uh, and a very painful death at that. Sometimes we see this happening with evil men even actually receiving their, their reward for their evil ahead of time. But don't always expect that. Uh, it certainly will be in the day of judgment. So uh, that's the first way. And of course, we also see uh, that he was hidden from the evil king. And the woman conceived and bare a son. And when she saw him, that he was a godly child, she hid him three months. Now, in the case of Jesus, we find again in Matthew 2.13, the angel of the Lord appearing to Joseph, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother and flee into Egypt. And there he's hidden from the wrath of Herod, Herod, Herod uh, assumes stabbing in the dark, killing every infant uh, two years and under in Bethlehem would finish off any uh, uh, present danger of a, of a king overtaking his, um, his throne. Well, then Moses was sent into Egypt to preserve his life. And so we see the daughter of Pharaoh, uh, of course, all of you are familiar with the text, I'm sure. She's out there in the River Nile, and she's bathing in the River Nile, and suddenly she hears the cry of an infant, saw the ark among the flags. She sent her maid to fetch it, and she had compassion on him. Well, in a similar uh, concept here, so, so he took the young child and his mother to night uh, by night and departed into Egypt and was there until the death of Herod. So uh, that's also uh, very similar in typology here of how they escaped the wrath of the king. Then we find Moses adopted by Pharaoh's daughter and the child grew and uh, she brought him unto Pharaoh's daughter and he became her son. Of course, there's incumbent royalty that's involved uh, with all, all of this. Moses has this excellent opportunity that we spoke about last week where, uh, but he despised the riches of Egypt and uh, and uh, threw his lot in with the people of God and became uh, part of the persecuted lot, a lot to give up. But he did so because uh, uh, down deep in his soul and his heart, uh, even though he 
uh, he knew his parents just for a brief moment. There is something, of course, wonderfully wrought in the genome and, and the inherited genes that uh, you can't deny, even after you're so many years departed from and uh, separated from, uh, he wanted to identify with his people. How this is all revealed to him, the, the text does not tell us, but he knows and he understands. And so we find also uh, Joseph, Joseph adopted by Joseph in the same way that Moses was adopted by Pharaoh. Uh, so then Joseph uh, took unto him his wife and knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn, called his name Jesus. Moses becomes the prince of Egypt now. We understand again the, the inheritance that was his, the riches, the wealth, the, uh, the great advantages, the tutelage that he would have received in the king's court. Remember, he doesn't really uh, take his stand until he's 40 years of age, so it's a long time to have Egyptian culture inculcated now, there's great hope in this, by the way, because you can be saved later in life, even though you spent most of your life as the de with the devil and the devil's ways, the devil's thoughts, and so on. But, but you can still be saved. Even at 40, you can be saved, can't you? And, and even at 80, for that matter. But um, that's quite a task at this point, because, again, you have all of the um, accoutrements of the world that you're used to, and the, the comforts, the pleasures, the sin, all of this, you know, that's very addictive. Uh, Satan does his very best to keep his people in tow. But greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And the Holy Ghost can call us out of the bar life. He can call us out of the fornication life. He can call you out of the pornography. He can call you out of the curse words. He can, he can change everything. And that's a miracle. It's called the miracle of conversion. We don't have a lot of that spoken about today, but that's what's supposed to happen when you get saved. Old things fall away and all things become new. And I'm still the old-fashioned kind that think when you become a Christian, your life changes. Uh, so, so Moses he became the prince of Egypt, and uh, he became her son. So there's what an adoption this was. Uh, but we also know that Jesus is the prince of peace, isn't he? He's the king of kings. He's the lord of all lords. So from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth. That's just one of his august titles, and we certainly know in Isaiah 9 that we have that in verse 7, that he's the prince of peace. So, um, so both of them were princes. Moses had a long period of silence from childhood to adulthood. Uh, we know nothing or very little about all of uh, what happened and transpired until uh, the text in Acts 7 gives us some backgrounds. When he was yet full 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. Well, how mysterious that one is, right? How did it come into his heart? Was there divine revelation? Did an angel come to speak to him? How was it that he got to know these things? Uh, but the Bible leaves that hidden to prurient eyes, and we've got to decide that God knows what he's doing, and he, he, has a, he has a means of making it all happen. So Jesus had a long period of silence also from a childhood to adulthood. Uh, so you, you can want to reject these nonsensical programs they put on television about the childhood of Jesus and, uh, and the Catholic uh, writings, the apocryphal writings about Christ as a child, as Superboy, you know, and all the things that he did and lifting up carts, you know, with one hand. And then you, you've got to totally reject it. Uh, what we call extra scriptural revelation. When people start talking about God told them this and that, you just oh, hang on here, you know. God spoke, and he put it in his word. After this, we don't add to or take from the revelation that's given. Amen. So the notion that we don't know anything about Jesus comes from the Bible itself. What do we know about him other than that one very brief uh, narrative that's found in Luke chapter 2, where we have uh, uh, Jesus at the end there, appearing in the temple at the age of 12 at his bar mitzvah, and he's uh, absolutely put in awe the teachers and the scribes and the Pharisees standing there, and he's answering them their questions and so on. So it's a marvel, of course. And then he rebukes his parents because they, they had lost track of him, and he said, I must be about my father's business. But then after this, all we know about him is that he grew in grace and the knowledge of the Lord uh, until we see him baptized the River Jordan at the age of 30. And Luke gives us the detail about this as well then. So it was uh, that Jesus being about 30 years of age when he uh, enters the ministry at the baptism and that would be his inception into the role of prophet and priest. 
Moses had compassion on the burdens of his people. When Moses was grown, he went out unto his brethren, and he looked on their burdens. It saddened his heart when he saw it. Justice was part of his DNA, and for reasons, again, that we're not sure of, he, he identified with these that were suffering. And so, uh, though he was a prince, uh, he becomes uh, a, a slave. So, Jesus had compassion also upon the burdens of the people. One of many places when Jesus says, Come unto me, all you that labor in a heavy laden, I will give you rest. And other places where it says, he looked upon the, the, uh, the people as uh, sheep scattered without a shepherd. He had compassion on them. Uh, Moses also tried to save a, a Hib, Hebrew kinsman. Joseph spied an Egyptian smiting an Hebrew, one of his brethren. He slew the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. Well, Jesus came to save the Hebrew kinsman first. He said, I'm not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And of course, in Luke 19, where he announces his mission, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Moses went from being a prince to a pauper. Now when Pharaoh heard this thing, he sought to slay Moses. But Moses fled from the face of Pharaoh and dwelt in the land of Midian. Jesus also left the wealth of heaven to be born in poverty. Oh, how he loves us, beloved. You all know this passage. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. You all know the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. That though he was rich, yet for your sakes, Paul's very personal here, right? He could have said for our sakes, but... He wanted to bring the, the message home personally. Take it personally. For your sakes, he became poor, that we through his poverty might be rich. So we understand this, this glorious condescension that he takes from this position, the right hand of God. Angels looking on at this in awe in Hebrews chapter 2, that he was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, but crowned with glory and honor that he by the grace of God should taste death for all men. So that, that passage tells us also do, of the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And to the Corinthians, who were objects of great grace, they were fornicators, they lived in the world by the lust of the flesh. Uh, and when Paul came to them to bring the message of eternal life, they became partakers of the riches of his grace. And he reminds them, he said, you know, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know what he did for you, in other words. And it must never be forgotten. Moses saved women, a woman at the well. Um, seven daughters came and drew water. And uh, among them was uh, to, to be his wife, Zipporah. And the shepherds came and drove them away. But Moses stood up and helped them and watered their flock. You know, I could mention even here, the shepherds in the spiritual context were the priests. They were the shepherds of Israel. Uh, Ezekiel speaks of the evil shepherds that feed themselves and not the flock and uh, excoriates their selfishness and uh, warns them of a, a, a doom, an impending doom. So these shepherds also, uh, you know, they're driving the people away, driving the daughters away uh, so that they can't use uh, the water that is there and so on. As I already mentioned, Jesus had compassion on the multitudes. He saw them as sheep without a shepherd. So uh, Jesus came to feed the flock, didn't he? He came to give everlasting water and everlasting bread of life. So Jesus saved a woman at the well. You know this so well in John 4, 14, the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst, neither come hither to draw, and uh, we know at that point that was a great moment of decision for her. And it, it became a time where she would have to surrender her old life. And no one is saved that must not first confess who they are and what they are. And so Jesus put her to the test and said, uh, go call your husband. <laughs> she said, well, I, 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 you know, can you imagine her answer? I have no husband. And he said, you speak truly, you have no husband because you've had five. So it, it's, uh, I use the expression, you know, she's the Elizabeth Taylor of the Bible, right? So, uh, and uh, there's no husband in the world ever satisfy you. You're looking for something better than what a husband can provide. And uh, 
you know, this it's such a critical moment right there. Of course, the woman changes the subject right away. She's uncomfortable under this kind of close inspection. She's recognizing this man is omniscient. He's never met me and he knows my life. And uh, so she changes the subject. She says, when Messiah comes, right? So she gets into an eschatological um, discourse with Jesus. She changes the subject, doesn't answer him directly. She already, he already knows the answer. What's the sense in trying to hide anything? And so she, what a, what a roundabout way of getting there. She says, when Messiah comes, he'll tell us all things. Why didn't she just say, are you the Messiah, right? But instead, when Messiah comes, and uh, he said, he that speaketh with thee is he. The moment of dawning, so to speak. Do you remember the moment of dawning when you got saved and when it dawned on you and you understood your condition, sinful condition? And the Lord, as it were, did an x-ray of your heart and you were found wanting. And, and then in that great moment, you surrendered to him. He's the omniscient one. I can't hide a thing from him. He that doeth truth cometh to the light, lest his, uh, that his deeds may be manifest that they are wrought in God. So, so she, uh, she leaves the water pot. You know, I just wrote the uh, devotional for Friday, and um, the devotional is um, two evils, two evils to avoid. And I use the text in Jeremiah 2. The two evils that Israel, you know, that they had forsaken the fountain of living water and took unto them and made unto them broken cisterns which cannot hold any water, right? So the two evils, forsaking God and then going after the, uh, the, uh, the trough of the world, you know, and, and, and being with the hogs and the pigs, you know, and slopping around in the filth. And uh, so I use the woman as an illustration. What does she do after she finds Jesus? Well, she came with a purpose to Sychar. She had the well there, and of course she had no right to it, but she's stealing the water and uh, Jesus gives her permission. So she takes, she takes the water pot, she's ready to take it down when Jesus starts this inquisition. If you knew who it was, you would ask of him. He would give you eternal water, everlasting water, living water, aqua viva, right? And so uh, <laughs> she stops what she's doing, you know, the industry. She's thirsty, but What's he saying here? And so she goes on with this polemic back and forth, you know, and, and, and finally arrives at the truth. Never got the water she came for. Didn't need it anymore. She left the water pot and went running back to her village to announce, I've found the Messiah. Found the Messiah. At any rate, Moses also saved women at the well. And uh, <laughs> Moses became a shepherd. So now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law. Now this is for 40 years, so it's a long period of time. And so if he's in Egypt for 40 years, God's going to have to do something about getting Egypt out of Moses. Because that's not so easy to do. It takes a long while to do it. And finally, of course, he purges out the old nature that had been inculcated since infancy. He had a lot of Egyptian custom that he had to crucify. And no better place to do it than the backside of a Midian desert, attending sheep all day long, that's all. And God would take from Moses the powers of articulation, the powers of uh, Egyptian prescient thought, you know, uh, idolatry or whatever he may have learned and so forth, even the warlike spirit that he would have been taught as Pharaoh's uh, son. This all had to be purged out and it took 40 years to get rid of it. Now he's 80 years of age, and I often say at 80, what are you thinking about doing? You're thinking about going to Florida and retiring, you know, and playing shuffleboard, something like that. And God said, you know, I think I can use you now. I think it's time to use you. And then we hear Moses stuttering and stammering, and, uh, you know, you can't speak. And you've got to send somebody else, you know, you've got the wrong man, and so forth. All that humility now, so much so that the Bible describes Moses as the meekest man that ever walked the earth. Well, of course, with the exception of Jesus, who was also meek and lowly in heart. So, kept the flock of Jethro, but Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. That is a good shepherd. In fact, in the same context in this discourse of the the shepherd, the good shepherd in John 10. You'll note also there in the 
ninth and 10th verses, he said, I am the door to the sheepfold. Uh, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. So Jesus said, I'm the door to the sheepfold. And uh, so if you're familiar, we've got these um, oh, a three foot parapet stone wall that that was the sheepfold. Sheep weren't uh, able to leap over it, so that wasn't a big problem. Three foot wall would be uh, certainly fine, but the wolf could easily jump over that wall uh, and try to get in the sheepfold another way. But the watchful eye of the shepherd, while the sheep were sleeping, the shepherd was alert and he kept the door of the sheepfold. Nothing was gonna get in there without his permission. And so he staved off all of the enemies and all the predators that might come to uh, make quick meal of the, sh of the sheep. Jesus, our great protector, protected us with his own life. He was the door to the sheepfold. He's the only way in. And once in, we are protected. See, there are many illustrations of his eternal security. Once entered into the sheepfold, my friends, the devil can't touch you. That's all good news. All right, so Moses' mission was to redeem Israel from slavery to Egypt. Uh, Come now, therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Jesus' mission was to redeem mankind from slavery to sin. Uh, we've got the uh, record here in Luke's account and Matthew's account of Jesus right after the 40 days of temptation. He comes down and enters into his local synagogue in Nazareth. And as he enters in there, he has right, having been bar mitzvahed, he, as a Jewish male, could read the scriptures. And so he uh, goes to the pulpit, opens the scroll. Fortuitously, the reading of the day was Isaiah. And he quotes Isaiah, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Uh, and to preach the gospel to the poor, to bind up the broken hearts, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord, uh, and to set at liberty them that are bruised. So these two uh, facets of the mission of Jesus here delineated in fulfillment to the prophecy on Isaiah is that he came to preach deliverance to those that are captive. Well, of course, in actuality, the Jews were captive to the Romans, though the priests refused to admit that. We were never slaves to anyone, they uh, boast. Well, what nonsense that is. They were slaves to the Babylonians first, and then to uh, the Persians and to the Greeks, and then at the time to the Romans. But uh, they were arrogant, and they retained their authority, they thought. But Jesus came to preach deliverance to those that were held captive by the Romans, and for that matter, in the spiritual sense, held captive by the devil himself and to set at liberty them that are bruised. So that was the notion, and of course, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord, which is jubilee. The jubilee is the deliverance, the uh, redemption, the people that would, uh, uh, would see the great light and uh, enter into the sabbatical year of rest, the jubilee year every 50 years. So that was his mission, to redeem mankind from slavery uh, to sin. So Moses was often rejected by his own people. See this in Numbers 14, 2, and all the children of Israel murmured against Moses. Well, Jesus often found people rejecting him as well, his own people. John tells us he came to his own, his own received him not. Luke tells us, and the Pharisees and the scribes murmured, saying, this man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. It was an outrage. Uh, what kind of a fastidious Jew would sit down with harlots and publicans? And uh, so, of course, they, as Jesus said, well, you know, they don't need a physician. I've come to, the, to those that need a physician. Those that are sick, I've come. So he's rejected by his own people, ultimately crucified. Now, Moses uh, will give God's law on the mountain of Sinai, Numbers 14. All the children of Israel murmured against Moses, but then he takes them up to the mountain, and uh, this is the mount that's in uh, the Sinai wilderness, Horeb, it's called Horeb, and it's also con called Sinai. So we have mountain ranges, and then we have specific mountain peaks. Uh, so Horeb would be the range, and uh, perhaps Sinai, the peak itself. But um, 
It was here that God would then speak to his people. I mean, it was a dramatic uh, occasion. The people gathered in the, in the valley below the mountain with the warning not to get anywhere near the mountain. That once God came down from heaven and lit upon that mountain, a great Shekinah cloud of glory surrounded the top of the mountain so that they couldn't even perceive through it. It had such an, a dense obscurity. And yet out of that cloud came lightnings and thunders and a terrifying voice. And uh, they dared not go near the mountain or even touch the mountain at that point. God was issuing forth his absolute and perfect laws, his moral laws. And so Jesus also gave out the laws. And when he did this, he went up to the mount. This is called the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Elements of are, are scattered throughout the other Gospels, but you'll, uh, you'll see them here and there, the various principles of that. But this is the actual and specific time that he gave out the orders of the kingdom. And how does it begin? He begins with the, the laws of the kingdom, the precepts. Blessed, he said, of the poor in spirit, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So he goes up to the mount to do this. And his three great teachings are all in a place of elevation. The Sermon on the Mount, the Olivet Discourse. He ascends the Mount of Olives and tells them of the end of the world. And then just before he dies, he, they ascend into the upper room. And in the upper room, he announces the coming of the Holy Spirit in the age of uh, grace. So he went up into the mountain and he opened his mouth and taught them saying, and so on. Blessed are the poor in spirit. There's the kingdom of God. Blessed are the meek. They shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they that mourn. They shall be comforted. Blessed are they that do hunger and thirst after righteousness. They shall be filled and so on. So he gives the precepts of the kingdom. And that's the introduction, the, the preamble to the Sermon on the Mount that, that goes on from there. He even gives us the Lord's Prayer and gives us many different warnings and so on. Matthew 5, 6 and 7. Great teachings. Moses spent 40 days of fasting on that mountain, and he was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. He did neither eat bread nor drink water. So Jesus does the same here. Uh, so he ascends what's called the Mount of Temptation. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungered. Remember, the devil immediately tempts the lust of the flesh and says, here are stones, command and turn them into bread. And Jesus rejects the temptation. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And uh, Satan is not easily defeated and comes back with a second and then a third temptation. But uh, he strikes out to strike out. And uh, he goes away, the Bible says. He left him for a while. Which <laughs> I always tell people, he'll leave you for a while. He'll be back, though. He'll be back when you least expect him. He'll come back and attack your vulnerabilities. He's gone away, but now he's taking notes on you. He's finding out what areas of weakness he might be able to send his demons to attack. And so beware. You may be on the top of the mountain in great victory over some sin and say, I think I've got this thing. And then sure enough, he that thinketh he standeth what? Take heed lest he fall. So Moses, then uh, he appointed 70 elders, you might recall here in Exodus 24. One, he said unto Moses, come up unto the Lord. Thou and Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel, and worship ye afar off. Oh boy, what an invitation that was. And so they went up and they, and they saw a beatific vision of heaven itself, and they saw the streets paved with sapphires. It must have been something, and it must have been so overwhelming that they only describe it in two, two verses, and then nothing more. We say, I'd like more of that. I just got finished in Leviticus, you know, and reading uh, chapter 13, 14, and 15. You know, it's all about what to do in the, uh, uh, in the case of leprosy. And each of those chapters has over 50 verses in it. You say, you know, do I need all of this? What do I need all this? Uh, and so on. But uh, I'd rather have more detail about the, that street that was paved with sapphire, but God said, You've, that's enough. That's all you get. You get a little taste. Pulls back the curtain. So Jesus appointed 70 witnesses also, didn't he? Luke chapter 10. After these things, the Lord appointed other 70 also and sent them two and two before his face into every city and place whither he himself would come. So that is a, a kind of a fulfilled typology as well in this um, sending forth of his aids. 
Moses stretched out his arms and defeated the enemy. Now, what a, what a story this is. The Amalekites, you know, are uh, prevailing in the battle. And uh, God gives instruction. And thank God Moses has uh, for uh, Aaron and her. And they are his sidekicks, his aide de camps. And uh, Moses is uh, lifting up the, his hands to heaven in prayer and intercession. Remember now, he's 80 years of age. And uh, so he's, he's an old man at this point. Hard. I, I, can you get your arm all the way? Yeah. Find out if you, if you don't, you, you do this exercise on the wall, right? If you have rotator cuff problems, anybody have rotator cuff problems? But I've had three surgeries, but nobody seems to, nobody interviews me. I don't understand it. But uh, can you imagine Aaron's like this? How long are you going to keep your hands up like this? It's hard to do. So Jesus stretched out his arms, didn't he? And he defeated the enemy, remember? On the cross. And he lifts out his arms to east and west. And he saves those that will call upon him. Saves us from our enemy. Uh, Moses performed signs and miracles, didn't he? Acts tells us he brought them out after that he had showed wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness. Forty years. So, so many wonderful things uh, in this extraordinary period. Remember that a miracle is extraordinary, supernatural. Uh, and that's why we don't see it happening all the time. It wouldn't be supernatural if it happened all the time, if it was common. And so there are only brief epochs of uh, biblical history where you're going to see signs and wonders. But certainly in the days of Moses, that was the case. A little bit after with Joshua. You might have to move fast forward up to Elijah to find the next epoch of uh, multiplied miracles happening. You'll find them scattered here or there, but as far as concentrated miracles happening as in the case of Moses for 40 years, or in the case of Elijah for as long as he ministered, and then thereafter, Elisha. So uh, we don't expect great periods. It, then, of course, I think you'd have to fast forward to Jesus at that point. And then after him, for a brief time, the apostles. So supernatural signs and wonders uh, but jesus imagine being the jesus of nazareth a man approved of god among you by miracles wonders signs which god did by him in the midst of you all there's no coincidence here in the correlation between these two remember that moses fed the people in the wilderness it is manna they said it's an interesting word it means what is it it is manna it is what it is for they wist not what it was. And Moses said unto them, This is the bread which the Lord hath given you to eat. Well, Moses is the dispenser. And perhaps I've chosen a poor word here that he fed the people. He really didn't. Jesus even tells the people this in John 6. Moses didn't give you that bread. God did, right? But he's, he is the vehicle that God used. And thus Jesus fed the people in the wilderness. Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples, and the disciples to them that were set down. And Moses was rejected by his own family, Numbers 12, 1. This is a sad occasion. Uh, why even bring it up? But you know, here it is, Miriam and Aaron. So we have the older siblings in this case, and the baby Moses, you know. And uh, I guess they needed to exercise their superiority, whatever, whatever the problem was. They, uh, they had to reject him. And uh, in, in particular, they criticized his marital choice of marrying an Ethiopian. Uh, uh, so she, she wasn't uh, Jewish, so she's a Gentile. And that was a, a point of rejection. And Miriam and Aaron spake against Moses. But God never forbade that, so uh, why should they? So, we see also that Jesus was rejected by his own family. John 7, a very telling point, for neither did his brethren believe in him. Uh, and Mark's gospel even tells us a bit more about that. So the idea of his own brothers, Joseph was one of his brothers. Jude was one of his brothers. He had James as a brother. Uh, so his own brethren did not believe in him. And uh, in John 7, they actually kind of put him to the test. Well, if you do all these things that you're purportedly doing, go show yourself publicly. 
uh, so that all of us can believe. They didn't believe, and that's why John adds the comment. They didn't believe him. Uh, so they rejected his own claim of Messiahship. Uh, what a sad occasion. Now, later they got saved. In 1 Corinthians, we find out that they were actually converted, and actually two of them became writers of the New Testament. So Moses offered his life for the salvation of his people after the sin of the golden calf. This is an amazing passage. Easy to remember, 32, 32. Yet now, if thou wilt forgive me, he's talking to God, if, if thou wilt forgive their sin, and then you have this strange punctuation here with a long uh, a dash and then a semicolon. And this indicates, um, it was a way of indicating that there is a pause here, a pregnant lacuna, that what happens at, at this moment is that Moses is actually thinking through what he has just said. How often that is the case for us, we say something. How many times have you said something, wish you could take it back? They just found out, I just found out that iPhones now, when you write a text, how many of you have sent a text and said, oh, I wish I hadn't sent that? Or, or I, I didn't say it the way I wanted to say it, right? And you wish you could take it back, but it's already gone that fast. And you'd like to take it back. The iPhone now is saying, uh, I'm going to give you a second chance. Now, isn't that a nice thing, right? iPhone saying, I'm going to give you a little chance to think about it. I don't, I don't know. I haven't seen the feature yet, but I'll, I'll bet it's a 10-second chance. You know, you got to think. You better think fast or it's gone, right? <laughs> but I think that's what is involved with the punctuation here. He's thinking about it. What did I just say? But it also indicates that he meant what he said. And so he, giving pause to it, in a sense, makes makes the statement all the more pregnant with meaning. Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin, and if not, you see, so, if you won't forgive them, then blot my name out of the book of life. I mean, it's an incredible prayer. There's a similar one. We know this in, in Romans. We just studied it with Paul that said, you know, that he would be accursed for his brethren, kinsmen in the flesh. Uh, this is at a whole different level. I'm not there, certainly you're not there. But apparently Moses was there. He loved the people of God more than his own soul. Now, of course, he's a type of Christ. And isn't that exactly what Jesus does when he goes to the cross? He offers his life for the salvation of his own people. We could go to many places, but this is a good one. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. So there's the notion there of this vicarious atonement, uh, taking the place of the sinner, the just in the place of the unjust. Well, now there are probably many more typologies I could explore here with you. These, I think, are probably the most salient of them, but there, there are others, and as you go through the book of Exodus, you may stop and pause and say, what, doesn't that sound like Christ? Wouldn't that be like Jesus? Um, we think of the, the time that Moses uh, says, take me up, I want to see your face, and, and so on. Um, and, and how often Jesus went to the mountains by himself and sought the Lord. We think of Moses coming down from the mountain after communing with God for 40 days, and he comes down shining, his face is so effulgent with brightness that the people say, we can't even look at you. So he had to cover his face. But then we think of the transfiguration with Jesus on the mount with Moses and Elijah in a glorified state. Their garments glistening white. And they're, they're shining like the sun. Well, again, there's, there are many types as you're reading the book of Exodus and Numbers and Deuteronomy. You're going to maybe pause along the way and, and ruminate and think, this is so much like the Savior. None of this is by accident. None of this is done by chance. All right, so we're going to move on in Hebrews 11 here tonight, just kind of skim the surface on a few other of the heroes of the faith, though even not denominated here. We know that Hebrews 11.30 is speaking about Joshua, Joshua who fit the battle of Jericho. So by faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they were compassed about seven days. And so the occasion here has to do with uh, Joshua, who now has uh, ascended to the position of Moses. He's now the leader of Israel. Moses 
has gone up to Pisgah. He will not go into the promised land. He, uh, even the meekest man that walked the earth uh, had a moment of pride. And as a result, God said, you're not going into the promised land. And, uh, you know, behold the goodness and the severity of God. And so Joshua would lead the people. But uh, he was given the promise, be strong and of good courage, uh, that God would neither leave him nor forsake him, and that, that the same spirit that was on Moses would be upon Joshua. And so Joshua takes and, and uh, believes that God will be with him. And not only that, God meets him in a theophanic form as the captain of the Lord, Lord's hosts. And once Joshua is assured that, are you for us or for them? And once knowing that the captain of the Lord hosts is, is with us, there was no fear. And so the instruction, the battle logistics were given. Remember, the Jews, are, in a sense, are almost an unarmed force. Let's put them at three million, four million. So how many fighting men of the th four million are there? And, uh, and what weaponry have they? Now, we know that they made spoil of the Egyptians, and, uh, but what did they take with them? Uh, we don't think that they had any uh, great armaments. They might have had some spears or whatever, but they certainly weren't as well equipped as Jericho. Jericho now was a fortified city. They had their security and their defense now for years. What possible victory could the people of God bring against so formidable an adversary? Well, if God be for us, who can be against us? The only thing they had going for them was faith. And so the Bible here gives us a single line. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down. And after they were compassed about seven days. So now this expression, by the way, that goes back to the book of Joshua, that the, that the, that the walls fell down. And uh, the original language, as it is here appearing now in, in the Greek, both indicate that, that the walls fell in a, uh, in a special and ordered fashion, that they fell down and outward, which uh, becomes fascinating because they have done this, the archaeological digs at uh, Jericho, and they found Jericho. This is some, what, 60, 80 years ago. They found, I think, uh, most of the, they, they started the digging and it carried on to the next generation, but what they found is absolutely fascinating. And they barely started the digging and it carried on to the next generation, but what they found is absolutely fascinating and a verification of this very text. Both the stone wall and the mud brick wall on top of it made up the outer wall that surrounded the city. Further up the embankment was another mud brick wall. This wall is what the Israelites were looking at as they marched around the city. This stone facing wall, on top of it, a high mud brick wall. As they were marching around the city, they must have been thinking, how are we going to capture this city? Because it is so well fortified. Referring to our ancient text, Joshua 6.20 says that on the seventh day, at the sound of the trumpets, the wall collapsed. And the uh, Bible is very specific in how it uh, describes that event. Uh, the Hebrew wording there is the walls takath uh, fell beneath themselves. And on the seventh trip around, we're told in the Bible, the mud brick wall collapsed and it fell outward and down to the base of the stone retaining wall. And when the archaeologists dug in this area, they found this pile of mud bricks all the way along the retaining wall. So where I am right now is where the pile of red bricks were found. That's correct. The Germans, Garstang, and Kenyon all found these piles of collapsed mud bricks while excavating at the base of the stone retaining wall. Then she shows that she dug down the side of that revent, the outside of that revetment wall, and then there were red, reddish, uh, collapsed bricks that she said came from the top of that stone wall. Yes, yes, yes. Which is another reason to suppose that these weren't, you know, there were walls on top. They're not in situ, but the collapsed brick has come down. Yes, 
if you have a, wall, a brick wall sitting on top of a stone revetment and it falls over, what, where else can the bricks go? Um, they've got to go to the bottom. And so with that, with that pile of bricks, what does, that, what does that tell us? Does that tell us that there was a destruction of the wall? Oh, certainly. It certainly is evidence of that destruction. These fallen bricks from the city wall can be seen in this diagram from Kenyon's excavation report. In her write-up, she makes it clear that it was not the stone retaining wall that fell, but rather the mud brick wall that once stood on top of it. And so she writes that up in her report that uh, here we have a, a collapsed city wall and here's the evidence for it. The archaeological understanding of how the walls of Jericho fell matches well with the ancient description of the wall falling beneath itself. This find of a collapsed city wall found here at Jericho is unique in archaeology. At no other site have we found evidence for a city wall that has fallen down. Yes, there were remains of the mud brick that had fallen down. I mean, that wall came tumbling down. So the Bible says that the wall came tumbling down. The archaeologists then came and dug Jericho. And what did they find? They found a collapsed city wall. This fits perfectly with the description from the ancient text. And when you have that text, and you have the archaeology, and you can fit them together, then you have the evidence from both sides, the literary evidence and the actual uh, physical evidence from what the Bible is talking about. So even in the text here, we don't have Joshua's name specifically, but the, the miracle of uh, the collapse of the wall. It would be later, after uh, many victories, that Joshua uh, is speaking now of his retirement. And uh, so he says, if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve. So he puts the people to a test. And the people were quite idolatrous. And this is the, I mean, the theme of Joshua and then judges, of course, even worse, is this um, repeated uh, terrible cycle of great victory, the power of God, miraculous events, and then uh, little by little, the people become uh, complacent, uh, used to the blessings of God, and then that leads ultimately to worldliness and carnality and to idolatry, and, uh, and then judgment. And then God sends a deliverer, and when God sends these deliverers, then there's a time of revival again, and then they repeat the process, and this is what the end of uh, Joshua is about and the beginning of the book of Judges and we're, we'll see some other names here that I mentioned, Jephthah and uh, other judges uh, like Barak and, and these were individuals that were, that brought revival momentarily, Samson. So he said, he put them to the challenge here. So he says, if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, then who, whom will you serve? Choose you this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. People answered and said, God forbid that we should forsake the Lord and to serve other gods. Well, of course, that's the typical answer. You know, when you put somebody to the test, of course I'm a Christian, you know. <laughs> but, but when it really comes down to it, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord. But they'll be cast out of his presence because they weren't really, they didn't belong to him at all. Uh, they served the flesh. But all the while, they, they wanted the name of Christ to cover their sins, and that's about as far as their dedication goes. Uh, Joshua knew, just as Jesus would know later, the hearts of men. Uh, then we have a story here in Hebrews. Um, By faith the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not when she had received the spies with peace. And so here in this city of Jericho, and this coming right on the heels of the other uh, expression of the walls falling down, uh, there was salvation even in the midst of this terrible judgment. And here's this pagan uh, who, uh, living there in the walls of Jericho, idolatrous, and of course living as a prostitute, a harlot, um, demonstrates faith, and uh, a faith without the word of God or without any uh, of the accoutrements, teachers or uh, anybody that could have pointed her to the truth. But there is the witness of the heart, isn't there? So by faith, the harlot 
Rahab perished not with them that believed not when she had received the spies with peace. So the, the spies here looking, uh, as soon as they get into the city, looking for a place that they can hide. And so they go into the very first house they find, and it's the harlot's house. And um, it's an intriguing story. Second chapter of Joshua, and she said unto the men, I know that the Lord hath given you the land and that your terror is fallen. So we see the elements of faith already. Uh, what does she already know? She knows what the citizenry of Jericho knows, and that is that the Lord God, he is the God. And she said unto the men, I know the Lord hath given you the land, that your terror is fallen upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. You know, this is a primitive faith, you might say, but it takes the faith of a grain of mustard seed. It takes the faith of a child. God isn't requiring uh, you know, theological um, a doctorate to be able to be saved. Instead, it gives opportunity for us to be saved with the simplest of revelations. And this seems to be the case for Rahab. She exercises childlike faith in the little that she knew. But she goes on in the discourse, for we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt. Now, you know, they didn't have news, they didn't have a CNN with reporters, you know, flying to the scene of the Red Sea, you know. Uh, they didn't have the newspapers, but the word got there, didn't it? Which tells us again that God is much more willing to save than he is to damn. And opportunities are given. And again, these are, this is a scant revelation. How much did Rahab know? Not much. But she knew enough. The word was out and uh, it couldn't be contained. What happened to the children of Israel in Egypt had reached all the way to the Holy Land. And so, uh, and what ye did unto the two kings of the Amorites, this was a little closer to the home, uh, that were on the other side of Jordan, Sion and Og, whom ye utterly destroyed. They were giants, weren't they? And as soon as we heard these things, our hearts did melt. Neither did there remain any more courage in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and in earth beneath. So when it says by faith, the harlot Rahab, right? Uh, what faith? That's enough to save right there. She made a profession of faith in the living God. The revelation was certainly primitive. Her belief was certainly primitive, but it was the beginning of great things for her life and a conversion. And so, behold, when we come into the land, thou shalt bind this line of scarlet red in the window, which thou didst let us down by. And Joshua saved Rahab, the harlot alive. So the, sto the story is a glorious story. Uh, it's the story of the scarlet thread. And uh, in this case, the spies hide themselves and Rahab makes sure, and she risks her life in doing this. If she's found out hiding and conspiring with the enemy, she would be put to death and a torturesome one at that. So she takes the risk. Why? Because she says, your God's better than our God's and I'm gonna identify with them. And so she hides these two spies and in return, there's a favor and a boon that's given. They said, now, you'll let us down so we can go back and make our reports. And she lets them down with the scarlet thread. Well, of course, the scarlet, that was the color of the harlot, wasn't it? She wore the scarlet color. And so she had scarlet rope, and she used it so that they could escape. And they said, now, leave this in the window. And when we come back to destroy your city, that will be a token to us to pass over this house. The scarlet thread. Now, unfortunately, we're at the end of our study. So next Wednesday, uh, I'll give you our lesson on the scarlet thread. It runs from Genesis to Revelation. So help us, dear Lord, we pray for uh, the ability to take and assess what we hear and then to apply it. That is to, to us, Lord, to be avid students of this word, to study and show ourselves approved. It is for us too, Lord, to believe what it says. And there are some wonderfully incredible things in the Bible. And we're glad, Lord, to just simply stand in awe and wonder of it. We're not here to ask questions of the divine. We 
we help us, Father, to believe. Uh, we notice here the childlike faith of one like Rahab, uh, certainly in dramatic contrast to many of these other heroes who had much that had been given to them, but then much required of them. In this case, a rather simple test. So Lord, I, I just pray that we would all, uh, with what little faith we may have, that we would attain the blessings as well. Now, Lord, it's too late for us to be included in Hebrews 11, but there's another book that you've written called the Book of Life. There's the Book of Works. Uh, there's the Book of Remembrance that you speak of in Malachi 3. And in that case, Lord, tonight all that are in this room have been written in that book because we have gathered together and we've spoke often of thee and spoken of the fear of the Lord. And your promise is that you would write down in that book of remembrance and that in the great day that you would spare us as a father spareth his own son and servant. So prosper us tonight, Lord. I'm so glad to be in the house of God. Thank you for our happy time of singing, Lord, during the saints gather together in this fashion, Lord, and it unites our heart to fear your name. And certainly you delighted, Lord, to receive the blessings of our praise. For there, Lord, you inhabit our praises in Jesus' name. We invite you to accept the plan of salvation that God has laid forth from the foundations of the earth. And the first point of that plan is that all have sinned. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. So begin by confessing your sin before God, that you have sinned against Him. and You can't even recollect all of the times that you've offended him. He has the record and that record needs to be expunged. Secondly, it's important to know that God will punish sin. If it goes without atonement, we will pay the ultimate price. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And that eternal price is hell, fire, and brimstone. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. But Jesus paid the price and made the atonement on the cross. God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. When Jesus died, he said, it is finished. He made an end to our damnation and our debt that we owed to him, paid by his own blood and justifies us before a holy God. On the third day in triumph, Jesus rises from the dead that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So call upon him today. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation.